After returning to Palos from his first voyage on March 15, 1493, Christopher Columbus was welcomed by the monarchs and received with great honors. The letter describing his journey, composed aboard the ship during his return, was published by the Crown and, thanks to the printing press, was republished in several languages throughout Europe that was boasting of Castile taking de facto possession of more than 150 islands previously unknown to Europeans, but presumed to be off the coast of Asia. This hardly pleased the King of Portugal, who, having interviewed Columbus, knew that these islands were slightly south to the latitude of the Canaries and, invoking the Treaty of Alcasovas, claimed them for Portugal. The Spanish monarchs appealed to Pope Alexander VI, born Rodrigo Borgia in the Kingdom of Aragon, to recognize Castilian sovereignty over the newly discovered islands and other to-be-discovered territories in that area. This dispute was concluded with four papal bulls and the Treaty of Tudesillas of 1494. The treaty established meridian passing at 370 leagues west of the Cape Verde Islands and stated that all lands discovered east of that line were going to belong to Portugal, while the ones at the west were going to belong to Castile. But the Pope added a religious dimension to what had originated as a purely commercial venture. He claimed authority over the matter, affirming that the Castilian enterprise of the Indies was an evangelical mission. At the same time, the Pope appointed the Benedictine friar Bernardo Buyil as a papal emissary to the Grand Khan, whom Marco Polo centuries earlier had described as the ruler of China. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel, the Pope and his entourage, were convinced that the final conversion of the world to Christianity was about to begin. According to Columbus, the natives of these islands off the coast of Asia were willing to accept the Queen's sovereignty and ready to become Christians. In a burst of enthusiasm inspired by Columbus's description of the lands and people he had found, the monarchs hurried to organize a second voyage. The Colombian historian that Man Osiniegas describes very lively. Four months went into the preparations for the voyage, and these preparations included talking with people, signing on the crew, chartering ships, arming them with cannon, supplying lances, swords, sea biscuit, wine, flour, oil, vinegar, and cheese. The object of this trip was not the discovery of new routes, but the establishment of a colony. So masons, carpenters, smiths, workmen, and farmers were needed as tools and seeds. A church would have to be erected, and the first priests sent out. Pinelli bought vestments for the priests as well as altar, chalice, and all the liturgical objects required. The majority of the crew were Andalusians and Basques, but it also included three Genoese and one Venetian. Eventually, the result was probably the largest fleet yet to sail from Europe. 17 ships with more than 1,200 people. Once again, Columbus carried in his holds the merchandise that Europeans traditionally sold to Asia, bolts of woolen cloth. And his goal was once again to bring back the coveted merchandise specified in the capitulations initially signed with the monarchs, pearls, gold, silver, precious gems, and spices. The fleet departed from Cadiz on September 25th, 1493, and the crossing went smoothly. Yet, upon arrival on Hispaniola, nothing worked out as they had planned. The fort of La Navidad had been completely destroyed, and the 39 men left behind had been all killed by the Taino. After founding a fortified new colony, La Isabella, in a safer place, Columbus sent back to Spain 12 of the ships under the command of Antonio de Torres to report back to the monarchs and to ask for more supplies. Frightened by the attacks of the natives, bothered by the hot and humid climate they were not used to, and annoyed by the hard work, 
most of the 1,200 people chose to return to Castile with Torres. The fleet carried some gold, spices, parrots, and enslaved natives, most of whom died during the crossing. It also brought the bad news about La Navidad and some complaints about Columbus's methods of government. As soon as they left, in February 1494, Columbus was put to sea again, exploring the coastline of Cuba and Jamaica. He was still convinced that he was on the threshold of Asia, and he was arduously looking for the golden cities of Marco Polo. Arriving at the western end of Cuba, he imposed an oath on his followers, on pain of cutting their tongues, that what they saw was mainland, that is, what we understand today as a continent, that could not be other than Asia. Eventually, they returned to Hispaniola, only to find the colony ravaged by war. The Spaniards had taken revenge for the massacre at La Navidad and were openly fighting not only the natives, but also among themselves, having separated into factions. By January 1495, Columbus and his Taino allies had gained back control of the island and had acquired more than a thousand prisoners of war. Meanwhile, four caravels had returned from Castile with Torres, bringing supplies and waiting to be loaded with Asian merchandise. But there was no merchandise to load. Desperate, Columbus made what later proved to be a very uninspired decision. He would send the war prisoners to be sold as slaves. He selected 500 of them and loaded them onto Torres's caravels to be delivered to Bishop Fonseca, who was the supervisor of all the affairs concerning the West Indies, and to Gennato Barardi, who was in charge of Columbus's business, with instructions to be sold on the Seville slave market. During the following months, more and more voices back in Castile were complaining about Columbus's harsh treatment applied both to the natives and to the colonists. Despite their promises, the monarchs issued a royal edict providing that anyone who wished to go to explore the Indies might do so, on the condition that they would carry one-tenth of their cargo free of charge for Hispaniola, and would pay to the crown one-tenth of their profit upon their return. This was the first attack on Columbus's claim to exclusive rights. Berardi immediately tried to protect the Admiral's interests and requested the monarchs the exclusive right to freight all the ships of the Crown. He was mandated at once to assemble a fleet of 12 ships. Unfortunately, he died suddenly in December 1495, leaving Henri Vespucci as the executor of his will and in charge of completing the contract with the Crown. The first four ships of the Promised Twelve left from San Lucar de Barrameda in January 1496, but they perished in the Gibraltar, engulfed by a storm. At the same time, on Hispaniola, a royal steward, Juan Aguado, was sent to investigate Columbus's conduct. Worried about the potential result of this investigation, Columbus decided to accompany the steward back to Castile to personally explain to the monarchs his position. He left La Isabella on March 10, 1496, and reached Cadiz on June 11. This time he was received rather coldly. The king and queen were busy with a war with France and building alliances with other European royal houses. Their daughter, Infanta Juana, later known as Juana the Mad, was to be married to Philip of Austria, the son of Maximilian, the future emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. It took three months until the sovereigns found time to see Columbus. They were benevolent towards him, but the court was suspicious. Nevertheless, a new voyage was planned, and it was once again supposed to be a voyage of exploration to find a southern passage along the coast Columbus had threaded, towards the marvels of the Indies. 
but the departure was delayed for more than another year for at least two reasons. The first was that the monarchs focused on reinforcing the alliance with the Holy Roman Empire by also marrying their son, Infante I, with Maximilian's daughter, Princess Margaret of Austria. Shortly after that was accomplished, the whole court was in mourning when Margaret had a miscarriage. The second reason was that recruiting a crew had become very difficult. As people had heard many stories, the initial enthusiasm was exhausted, and they didn't want to put their lives at risk anymore. So, the Crown had to issue a proclamation authorizing prisoners to exchange their indictments for going with Columbus to the Indies. If you have enjoyed this video and would like to find out how Columbus's rise was followed by the fall that led to him being brought back to Castile in chains, please join me for the next video.